Stanford University. We'll get back started again um, with CS224N, Natural Language Processing with Deep Learning. So, um, so you're in for a respite or a change of pace today. So um, for today's lecture, um, what we're principally going to look at is syntax, grammar, and dependency parsing. Um, so my hope today is to um, teach you in one lecture enough about dependency grammars and parsing that you'll all be able to do the main part of assignment two successfully. Um, so quite a bit of the early part of the lecture is giving a bit of background about syntax and dependency grammar, and then starting to talk about a particular um, kind of dependency grammar, transition-based, oh, sorry, dependency parsing, transition-based dependency parsing, and then it's probably only in the last kind of 15 minutes or so of the lecture that we'll then get back into um, specifically um, neural network content, talking about a dependency parser that Danchi and I wrote a couple of years ago. Okay, so. Um, for general reminders, I hope you're all really aware that assignment one is due today. Um, and I guess by this stage, you've either made um, good progress or you haven't. Um, but to give my, um, um, my um, good housekeeping reminders, I mean, it seems like every year there are people that sort of blow lots of late days on the first assignment for no really good reason. And that isn't such a clever strategy. Uh, so um, hopefully, um, you are well along with the assignment and can aim to hand it in um, before it gets to the weekend. Um, okay, then secondly, um, today is also um, the day that the new assignment comes out. Um, so um, maybe you won't look at it till the start of next week, but we've got it up ready to go. And so that will involve a couple of new things. And in some respects, probably for much of it, you might not want to start it until after next Tuesday's lecture. Um, so two big things that will be different for that assignment. Um, big thing number one is we're going to do assignment number two using TensorFlow. And that's the reason why, quite apart from exhaustion from assignment one, why you probably don't want to start it on the weekend is because on Tuesday, Tuesday's lecture is going to be an introduction to TensorFlow. So you'll really be more qualified um, to start it after that. And then the other um, big different thing in assignment two as we get into some sort of more substantive um, natural language processing content. In particular, um, you guys are going to build neural dependency parsers, and the hope is that you can learn about everything that you need to um, know to do that um, today, or perhaps looking at some of the readings on the website if you don't get quite everything straight from me. Um, couple more comments on things. Okay, so um, for final projects, um, we're going to sort of post um, hopefully tomorrow on the weekend a kind of an outline of what's in assignment four so you can have a sort of a more informed meaningful choice between whether you want to do assignment four or come up with a final project. Um, the area um, of assignment four if you do it is going to be um, question answering over the squad data set but we've got a kind of a page and a half description to explain what that means so you can look out for that. But if you are interested in doing a final project um, again Again, really encourage people to come and meet with one of the final project mentors or find some other well-qualified person around here to be a final project mentor. So our, what we're wanting is that sort of everybody has met with a, their final project mentor before putting in an abstract and um, that means it'd be really great for people to get started doing that as soon as possible. I know some of you have already talked to various of us. Um, for me personally, I've got final project office hours tomorrow from 1 to 3 p.m. So I hope um, some people um, will come by for those. And again, sort of as Richard mentioned, um, not everybody can possibly have um, Richard or me as the final project mentor. And besides, there's some really big advantages of having some of the PhD student TAs as final project mentors because, you know, really for things like spending time hacking on TensorFlow, they get to do it much more than I do. And so um, Danchi, Kevin, um, Ignacio, Arun, that they've had tons of experience doing NLP research using deep learning and so that they'd also be great mentors and um, look them up for their final project um, advice. 
Um, the final thing I just want to touch on is um, we've clearly had a lot of problems, I realize, at keeping up and coping with people in office hours and Q status has just regularly gone out of control. Um, I'm sorry that that's been kind of difficult. I mean, honestly, we are trying to work and work out ways that we can do this better. And we're thinking of sort of unveiling a few changes um, for doing things um, for the second assignment. Um, if any of you peoples have um, um, any better advice as to how things could be organized so that they could work better, feel free to send a message on Piazza with suggestions of ways of doing it. Um, I guess yesterday I, I um, ran down Percy Liang and said, Percy, Percy, how do you do it for CS221? Do you have some big secrets to do this better? Um, but unfortunately, I seem to um, come away with no big secrets because it sort of said, oh, we use Q status and we use the Huang basement. What else are you meant to do? Um, so I'm still looking for that divine insight uh, that will tell me how to get this um, problem better under control. Um, so if you've got any good ideas, feel free to share. Um, but we'll try and um, get things um, as much better under control as we can um, for um, the following weeks. Okay, any questions or should I just go into the meat of things? Okay. Um, Right, so, um, so what we're going to want to do today is work out how to put structures over sentences in some human language. All the examples I'm going to show is for English, um, but in principle, the same techniques you can apply to any language where these structures are going to sort of reveal how the sentence is made up. So that the idea is that sentences and parts of sentences have some kind of structure and there are sort of regular ways that people put sentences together. So we can sort of start off with very simple things that aren't yet sentences like the cat and our dog and they seem to kind of have um, a bit of structure. We have an article or what linguists often call a determiner that's followed by a noun. And then, well, you, um, for those kind of phrases, um, which get called noun phrases that describe things, you can kind of make them bigger and there are sort of rules for how you can do that. So you can put adjectives in between the article and the noun and you can say the large dog or a barking dog or a cuddly dog um, and things like that. And well, you can put things like what are called prepositional phrases after the noun. So you can get things like um, a large dog in a crate or something like that. And so um, traditionally what linguists and natural language processors have wanted to do is describe the structure of human languages. And they're effectively two key tools that people have used to do this. And one of these key tools, and I think in general the only one that you've seen a fraction of is to use, um, well in computer science terms, what is most commonly referred to as context-free grammars, which are often referred to by linguists as phrase structure grammars, and is then referred to as the notion of constituency. And so for that, for that what we're doing is writing these context-free grammar rules. And at least if you're a Stanford undergrad or something like that, I know that way back in 103, you spent a whole lecture learning about context-free grammars and their rules, right? So I could start writing some rules that might start off saying a noun phrase can go to a determiner and a noun, and then I realized that now Noun phrases could get a bit more complicated and so I came up with this new rule that says noun phrase goes determiner, optional adjective, noun, and then an optional prepositional phrase where for a prepositional phrase that's a preposition followed by another noun phrase because I can say a crate or a large crate or a large crate by the door um, and then well I could get go along even further and say I could say you know a large barking dog um, by the door in a crate. So then I notice, oh wow, I can put in multiple adjectives there and I can stick on multiple prepositional phrases. So I'm using that star, the kind of cleany star that you also see in regular expressions to say that you can have zero or any number of these. And then I can start 
um, making a bigger thing like um, talk to um, the cuddly dog or look for the cuddly dog. And well, now I've got a verb followed by a prepositional phrase. And so I can sort of build up a constituency grammar. Um, so that's one way of organizing the structure of sentences. And, you know, in 20th, dragging into 21st century America, this has sort of been the dominant way of doing it. I mean, it's sort of what you see mainly in your C intro CS class when you get talk, talk about regular languages and context-free languages and context-sensitive languages. Um, you're working up the Chomsky hierarchy um, where um, Noam Chomsky did not actually invent the Chomsky hierarchy to torture CS undergrads um, with formal content to fill their CS 103 class. The original purpose of the Chomsky hierarchy was actually to understand the complexity of human languages and to make arguments about their complexity. Um, but um, if you look more broadly and, and sorry, it's also dominated sort of um, linguistics in America in the last 50 years through the work of Noam Chomsky. Um, but if you look more broadly than that, this isn't actually the dominant form of syntactic description that's been used for understanding the structure of sentences. So what else can you do? So there's this other alternative view of linguistic structure which is referred to as dependency structure. And what you're doing with dependency structure is that you're describing the structure of a sentence by taking each word and saying what it's a dependent on. So if it's a word that kind of modifies or is an argument of another word that you're saying it's a dependent of that word. So um, barking dog, barking's a dependent of dog because it's sort of a modifier of it. Large barking dog, large is a modifier of dog as well, so it's a dependent of it. Um, and dog by the door, so the by the door is somehow a dependent of dog and we're putting a dependency between words. And we normally indicate those dependencies as with arrows. And so we can draw dependency structures over sentences that say how um, they're represented as well. And when right in the first class, I gave examples of ambiguous sentences. A lot of those ambiguous sentences we can think about in terms of dependencies. So do you remember this one? Um, Scientists study whales from space. Um, well, that was an ambiguous headline. And well, why is it an ambiguous headline? Well, it's ambiguous because there's sort of two possibilities. So in either case, um, there's the main verb study, and it's the scientists that are studying, that's an argument of study, the subject, and it's the whales that are being studied, so that's an argument of study, that's the object. Um, but the big difference is then what are you doing with the from space? Are you saying that it's modifying study, um, or are you staying, it's modifying the whales? And like if you sort of just quickly read the headline, it sounds like it's the bottom one, right? It's whales from space. And that sounds really exciting. Um, but what, is really, <laughs> um, what the article was meant to be about was really that they were being able to use satellites to track the movements of whales. And so it's the first one where the from space is modifying um, how they're being studied. And so thinking about ambiguities of sentences can then be thought about in these in terms of the, many of them in terms of these dependency structures as to what's modifying what. And this is just a really um, common thing in natural language because these kind of questions of what modifies what really dominate a lot of uh, questions of interpretation. Um, so here's the kind of sentence um, you find when you're reading the Wall Street Journal every morning. Um, <laughs> You know, the board approved its acquisition by Royal Trust Co Limited of Toronto for $27 a share at its monthly meeting. And as I've helpfully indicated by the square brackets, if you look at the structure of this sentence, right, it sort of starts off as subject, verb, object, the board approved its acquisition. And then everything after that is a whole sequence of prepositional phrases by Royal Trust Co Limited of Toronto for $27 a share at its monthly meeting. Um, and well, you might, so then there's a question of well, what's everyone modifying? So the acquisition is by Royal Trust Co Limited. So that's 
um, by Royal Trustco Limited is modifying the thing that immediately precedes it. And of Toronto is modifying the company Royal Trustco Limited. So that's modifying the thing that comes immediately preceding it. Um, so you might think, oh, this is easy. Everything just modifies the thing that's coming immediately before it. But that then stops being true. So what's for $27 a share modifying? Yeah, so that's modifying the acquisition. So then we're kind of jumping back a few candidates and saying it's modifying acquisition. And then actually at its monthly meeting, um, that wasn't the, the Toronto, the Royal Trustco Limited, or the acquisition, that that was um, when the approval was happening. So that jumps all the way back to the top. So in general, the situation is that if you've got some stuff like a verb and a noun phrase, then you start getting these prepositional phrases. Um, well, the prepositional phrase can be modifying either this noun phrase or the verb. But then when you get to this second prepositional phrase, well, there was another noun phrase inside this prepositional phrase. So now there are three choices. It can be modifying this noun phrase, that noun phrase, or the verb phrase. And then we get to another one. So it's now got four choices. And you don't get, you don't get sort of a completely free choice because you do get a nesting constraint. So once I've had for $27 a share referring back to the acquisition, the next prepositional phrase has to, in general, refer to either the acquisition or approved. Um, I say in general because there are exceptions to that, and I'll actually talk about that later. But most of the time in English, it's true. You have to sort of refer to the same one or further back so you get a nesting relationship. But I mean, even if you obey that nesting relationship, um, the result is that you get an exponential number of ambiguities in a sentence based on n the number of um, prepositional phrases you stick on the end of the sentence. And so the series of the exponential series you get are these Catalan numbers. And so Catalan numbers actually show up a, in a lot of places in theoretical computer science because any kind of structure um, that is somehow sort of similar, if you're putting these constraints in, you get Catalan series. So if any, are any of you doing CS228? Um, yeah, so another place the Catalan series turns up is that when you've got a factor graph and you're triangulating it, um, the number of ways that you can triangulate your um, factor graph um, is also giving you um, Catalan numbers. Okay, um, so human languages get very ambiguous and we can hope to describe them um, on the basis of sort of looking at these dependencies. So that's important concept one. The other important concept I wanted to introduce at this point is this idea of four linguistics having annotated data in the form of tree banks. Um, this is probably a little bit um, small to see exactly, but what this is is we've got sentences. Um, these are actually sentences that come off Yahoo Answers. Um, and what's happened is um, human beings have sat around and drawn in the syntactic structures of these sentences as dependency graphs. And those things we refer to as tree banks. Um, and so a really interesting thing that's happened starting around 1990 is that um, people have devoted a lot of resources to building up these kind of annotated tree banks and various other kinds of annotated linguistic resources that we'll talk about later. Now, in some sense, um, from the viewpoint of sort of modern machine learning in 2017, that's completely unsurprising because all the time what we do is say we want label data so we can take our supervised classifier and chug on it and um, get good results. But you know, in many ways it was kind of um, a surprising thing that happened, which is sort of different to the whole of the rest of history, right? Because for the whole of the rest of the history, it was back in this space of, well, to describe linguistic structure, um, what we should be doing is writing grammar rules that de describe what happens in linguistic structure. Where here, we're no longer even attempting to write grammar rules. We're just saying, give us some sentences and I'm going to diagram these sentences and show you what their structure is. And tomorrow, give me a bunch more and I'll diagram them for you as well. Um, and if you think about it, you know, 
in a way that initially seems a kind of a crazy thing to do, because it seems like, you know, just putting structures over sentences one by one seems really, really inefficient and slow. Whereas if you're writing a grammar, you're writing this thing that generalizes, right? The whole point of grammars is you can write this one small finite grammar and it describes an infinite number of sentences. And so surely that's a big labor-saving effort. Um, but um, slightly surprisingly, but maybe it makes sense in terms of what's happened in machine learning, um, that it's just turned out to be kind of super successful, this building of explicit annotated tree banks. And it ends up giving us a lot of things. And I sort of mention a few of their advantages here. Firstly, it gives you a reusability of labor. That the problem of human beings handwriting grammars is that they tend to in practice be almost unreusable because everybody does it differently and has their idea of the grammar and people spend years working on one and no one else ever uses it. Where effectively these tree banks have been a really reusable tool that lots of people um, have then built on top of to build all kinds of natural language processing tools of part of speech takers and parsers and things like that. They've also turned out to be a really useful resource actually for linguists because they give a kind of uh, real languages as spoken complete with syntactic analyses that you can do all kinds of quantitative linguistics on top of. Um, it's genuine data that's broad coverage. When people just work with their intuitions as to what are the grammar rules of English, they think of some things but not of other things. And so this is actually a, a better way to find out all of the things that actually happen. Um, for anything that's sort of probabilistic or machine learning, it gives sort of not only what's possible but how frequent it is and what other things it tends to co-occur with and all that kind of distributional information is super important. And crucially, 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 and we'll use this for assignment too. It's also great because it gives you a way to evaluate any system that you built because this gives us what is we treat as ground truth, gold standard data, these are the correct answers, and then we can evaluate any tool on how good it is at reproducing those. Okay, so that's a general advertisement. Um, and what I wanted to do now is sort of go through a bit more carefully for sort of 15 minutes. Um, what are dependency grammars and dependency structure? So we've sort of got that straight. Um, where um, I guess I maybe failed to say, yeah, I mentioned there was the sort of con constituency context-free grammar viewpoint and the dependency grammar viewpoint. Um, today, it's going to be all dependencies, and what we're doing for assignment two is all dependencies. We will get back to some notions of constituency and phrase structure. Um, you'll see those coming back um, in later classes in a few weeks' time. Um, but this is what we're going to be doing today. And that's not a completely random choice. It's turned out that unlike what happened in linguistics in most of the last 50 years, then the last decade in natural language processing um, it's essentially been swept by the use of dependency grammars, that people have found dependency grammars just a really suitable framework on which to build semantic representations to get out the kind of understanding of language that they'd like to get out easily. They enable the building of very fast, efficient parsers, as I'll explain later today. And so in the last sort of 10 years, you've just sort of seen this huge sea change in natural language processing, where if you pick up a conference volume around the 1990s, it was basically all phrase structure grammars and one or two papers on dependency grammars. And if you pick up a volume um, now, what you'll find out is that of the papers that are using syntactic representation, kind of 80% of them are using dependency representations. Okay, yes? Oh, phrase structure, what's the phrase structure grammar? That's exactly the same as a context-free grammar when a linguist is speaking. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's formally a context-free grammar. Um, okay, what's, so what does a dependency syntax say? So the idea of dependency syntax is to say that the sort of model of syntax is we have relationships between lexical items, words, and only between lexical items. They're binary asymmetric relations, which means we draw arrows, um, and we call those arrows dependencies. So behold, there is a dependency analysis of bills on ports and immigration were submitted by Senator Brownback, Republican of Kansas. Okay, um, 
So that's a start. Normally when we do dependency parsing, we do a little bit more than that. So typically we type um, the dependencies by giving them a name for some grammatical relationship. So I'm calling this the subject, and it's actually a passive subject. Um, and then this is an auxiliary modifier, and Republican of Kansas is an appositional phrase um, that's coming off of Brownback. Um, and so we use this kind of typed dependency grammars. And I mean, interestingly, like I'm not going to go through it, but there's sort of some, some interesting math that if you just have this, although it's notationally very different um, from a context-free grammar, that these are actually equivalent um, to a, a restricted kind of context-free grammar with one addition. But things become sort of a bit more different once you put in a typing of the dependency labels. But I won't go into that um, in great detail. All right, so a substantive theory of dependency grammar um, for a language, we're then having to make some decisions. So what we're going to do is when we, we're going to draw these arrows um, between two things, and I'll just mention a bit more terminology. So we have an arrow, and it's got the t what would be called the tail end of the arrow, I guess. Um, and the word up here is the sort of the head. So bills is an argument of submitted. Um, were is an auxiliary modifier of submitted. And so this word here is normally referred to as the head or the governor or the superior or sometimes even the regent. Um, I'll, I'll normally call it the head. Um, and then the word at the other end of the arrow, the pointy bit, um, I'll refer to as the dependent, but other words that you can sometimes see are modifier, inferior, subordinate. Um, some people who dependency grammar really get into these classist notions of um, superiors and inferiors, but um, I'll go with heads and dependents. Um, Okay, so the idea is you have a head of a clause and then the arguments of it are dependence. And then when you have a phrase um, like by Senator Brownback, Republican of Texas, um, it's got a head which is here being taken as Brownback <laughs> and then it's got words beneath it. Um, and so one of the main parts of dependency grammars at the end of the day is you have to make decisions as to which words are heads and which words are then the dependence of the heads of any particular structure. Um, so in these um, diagrams I'm showing you here and the ones I showed you back a few pages, um, what I'm actually showing you here is um, analyses according to universal dependencies. So universal dependencies is a new tree banking effort, which I've actually been very strongly involved in, that sort of started a couple of years ago. And there are pointers in both earlier in the slides and on the website if you want to go off and learn a lot about universal dependencies. I mean, it's sort of an ambitious attempt to try and have a common dependency representation that works over a ton of languages. I could prattle on about it for ages. And if, the, if by some off chance there's time at the end of the class, um, I could, um, but probably there won't be. Um, so I won't actually tell you a lot about that now, but I will just mention one thing that probably you'll notice very quickly, and we're also going to be using this representation in the assignment that's being given out today. The analysis of um, universal dependencies treats prepositions sort of differently to what you might have seen elsewhere if you've seen any many accounts of English grammar or heard references in some English classroom to have prepositions having objects. Um, in universal dependencies, prepositions don't have any dependence. Prepositions are treated kind of like they were case markers, if you know any language like, you know, German or Latin or um, Hindi or something that has cases, um, so that the by is sort of treated as if it were a case marker of Brownback. Um, so there's an oblique modifier of by Senator Brownback, and so it's actually treating Brownback here as the head with the preposition as sort of like a case marking dependent of by. And that was sort of done to get more parallelism across different languages of the world. Um, but I'll just mention that. Um, other properties of universal depend oh sorry of all dependencies normally dependencies form a tree so there are formal properties that go along with that that means that they've got a single head um, they're acyclic 
and they're connected. Um, so those are sort of graph theoretic properties. Um, yeah, I sort of mentioned that really um, dependencies have dominated most of the world. So just very quickly on that, um, the famous first linguist um, was Panini, um, who um, wrote his grammar of Sanskrit around the fifth century BCE. I mean, really most of the work that Panini did was kind of on sound systems and makeups of words, phonology and morphology, when we mentioned linguistic um, levels in the first class. And he only did a little bit of work on the structure of sentences. Um, but the notation that he used for structure of sentences was essentially a dependency grammar of having word relationships being marked as dependent. Tendencies. Uh, question. Um, yeah, so th the question is, well, compare CFGs and PCFGs, um, and do they, you know, dependency grammars look strongly lexicalized, they're between words, and um, does that make it harder to generalize? You know, I honestly feel I just can't do justice to that question right now if I'm going to get through the rest of the lecture. Um, but I will make two comments. So, I mean, there's certainly the natural way to think of dependency grammars uh, they're strongly lexicalized, you're drawing relationships between words, whereas the simplest way of thinking of context-free grammars is you've got these rules in terms of categories, like noun phrase goes to determine a noun, optional prepositional phrase. Um, and so that is a big difference. Um, but, you know, it kind of goes both ways. So, you know, normally when actually natural language processing people want to work with context-free grammars, they frequently lexicalize them so they can do more precise probabilistic prediction and vice versa. If you want to do generalization and dependency grammar, you can still use at least notions of parts of speech to give you a level of generalization that's more like categories. Um, but nevertheless, the kind of natural ways of sort of turning them into probabilities and machine learning models are quite different. Though on the other hand, there are sort of some um, results of sort of relationships between them. But I think I'd better not go on a huge digression. But you have another question. Um, that means to rather than just have categories like noun phrase, to have categories like a noun phrase headed by dog. And so it's lexicalized. Let's leave this for the moment though, please. Um, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so that's part of the, and then, I mean, there's a whole big history, right? So um, essentially for like Latin grammarians, that what they did for the syntax of Latin, again, not very developed. They mainly did morphology, um, but it was essentially a dependency kind of analysis that was given. Um, there was sort of a flowering of Arabic grammar. Uh, grammarians in the first millennium, and they essentially had a dependency grammar. I mean, by contrast, I mean, really kind of context-free grammars and constituency grammar only got invented almost in the second half of the 20th century. I mean, it wasn't actually Chomsky that originally invented them. There was a little bit of earlier work in Britain, um, but only kind of a decade before. Um, so um, there was um, this um, French linguist, Lucien Tainer, he's often sort of referred to as sort of the father of modern dependency grammar. He's got a book from 1959. Um, dependency grammars have been very popular in more sort of free word order languages because um, notions sort of like context-free grammars work really well for languages like English that have very fixed word order, um, but a lot of other languages of the world have much freer word order, and that's often more naturally described um, with dependency grammars. Um, interestingly, one of the very first natural language parsers developed in the US um, was also a dependency parser. So David Hayes was one of the first US computational linguists and one of the founders 
founders of the Association for Computational Linguistics, which is our main kind of academic association where we publish our conference papers, um, etc. And he actually built in 1962 a dependency parser um, for English. Okay, so a lot of history of dependency grammar. Um, so a couple of other fine points to note about the notation. Um, people aren't always consistent in which way they draw the arrows. I'm always going to draw the arrows so they point, go from a head to a dependent, which is the direction in which Teen Air drew them. But there are some other people who draw the arrows the other way around, so they point from the dependent to the head. Um, so you just need to look and see um, what people are doing. Um, the other thing that's very commonly done, and we will do in our parsers, is you stick this pseudo word, which might be called root or wall or um, some other name like that at the start of the sentence. And that kind of makes the sort of math and formalism easy because then every sentence starts with root and something is a dependent of root or turned around the other way. If you think of what parsing a dependency grammar means is for every word in the sentence, you're going to say what is it a dependent of because if you do that, you're done. You've got the dependency structure of the sentence and what you're going to want to say then is, well, it's either going to be a dependent of some other word in the sentence or it's going to be a dependent of the pseudo word root, which is meaning it's the head of the entire sentence. Um, and so we'll go through some specifics of dependency parsing in um, the second half of the class. But you know, the kind of thing that you should think about is, you know, well, how could we just decide which words are dependent on what? And there's sort of various information sources that we could think about. Um, so yeah, it's sort of totally natural with the dependency representation to just think about word relationships. And that's great because that'll fit super well with what we've done already in distributed word representations. So actually doing things this way just fits well with the couple of tools that we already know how to use. Um, so we'll want to say, well, you know, discussion of issues, is that a reasonable attachment as a lexical dependency? And that's a lot of the information that we'll actually use. But there are some other use sources of information we'd also like to use. Dependency distance. So sometimes there are dependency relationships and sentences between words that are 20 words apart when you've got some big long sentence and you're referring back to some previous clause. But it's kind of uncommon. Most of dependencies are pretty short distance, so you want to prefer that. Um, many dependencies don't sort of span certain kinds of things. So if you have the kind of dependencies that occur in side noun phrases like adjective modifier, they're not going to cross over a verb. Um, it's unusual for many kinds of dependencies to cross over a punctuation. So it's very rare to have a punctuation between a verb and its object and things like that. So looking at the intervening material gives you some clues. And a final source of information is sort of thinking about heads and thinking how likely they are to have dependents in what number and on what sides. So the kind of information there is, right, a word like the is basically not likely to have any dependents at all anywhere. Um, so you'd be surprised if it did. Um, words like nouns can have dependents, but you know, and they can have quite a few dependents, but they're likely to have some kinds like determiners and adjectives on the left, other kinds like prepositional phrases on the right. Um, verbs tend to have a lot of dependence. So different kinds of words have different kind of patterns of dependence. And so there's some information there we could hope to gather. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I've already said the first point. Um, how do we do dependency parsing? In principle, it's kind of really easy. So we're just going to take every word in the sentence and say, um, make a decision as to what word or root this word is a dependent of. And we do that um, with a few constraints. So normally we require that only one word can be a dependent of root and we're not going to allow any cycles. And if we do both of those things, we're guaranteeing that we make the dependencies of a, a tree. Um, and normally we want to make our dependencies a tree. And there's one other property I then wanted to mention um, that if 
if you draw your dependencies if, as I have here, so that all the dependencies are being drawn as loops above the words, it's different if you're allowed to put some of them below the words, um, there's then a question as to whether you can draw them like this um, so that they have that kind of nice little nesting structure, um, but none of them cross each other, or whether, like these two that I've got here, um, where they necessarily cross each other and I couldn't avoid them crossing each other. And what you'll find is in most languages, certainly English, the vast majority of dependency relationships have a nesting structure relative to the linear order. And if a dependency tree is fully nesting, it's referred to as a projective dependency tree, that you can lay it out in this plane and have a sort of a, a nesting relationship. Um, but there are few structures in English where you get things that aren't nested and get crossing. And this is sentence as a natural example of one. So I'll give a talk tomorrow on bootstrapping. So something that you can do with noun modifiers, especially if they're kind of long words like bootstrapping or on techniques of bootstrapping is you can sort of move them towards the end of the sentence, right? I could have said, I'll give a talk on bootstrapping tomorrow, but it sounds pretty natural to say, I'll give a talk tomorrow on bootstrapping. But this on bootstrapping is still modifying the talk. And so that's referred to by linguists as right extra, extra position. And so when you get that kind of rightward movement of phrases, you then end up with these crossing lines. And that gives you what's referred to as a non-projective dependency tree. Um, just take, um, so importantly, you know, it is still a tree. If you sort of ignore the constraints of linear order and you're just drawing it out as a graph in theoretical computer science, right? It's still a tree. It's only when you consider this extra thing of the linear order of the words that you're then forced to have the lines to cross. And so that property, which you don't actually normally see mentioned in theoretical computer science discussions of graphs, is then this property that's referred to as projectivity. Yes? So the question is, is, is it possible to recover the order of the words from a dependency tree? So um, given how I've defined dependency trees, the strict answer is no. Um, they aren't giving you the order at all. Now, you know, in practice, um, people write down the the words of the sentence in order and have these crossing brackets, bra crossing arrows when they're non-projective. And of course, it'd be a straightforward thing to index the words. And obviously, you know, it's a real thing about languages that they have linear order, one can't deny it. But you know, as I've defined dependency um, structures, yeah, you can't actually recover the order of words from them. Okay, um, one more slide before we get to the intermission. Um, yeah, so in the second half of the class, I'm gonna tell you about um, a, a method of dependency parsing. I just wanted to say very quickly, you know, there are a whole bunch of ways that people have gone about doing dependency parsing. So one very prominent way of doing dependency parsing is using dynamic programming methods, which is normally what people have used for constituency grammars. Um, a second way of doing it is to use graph algorithms. So a common way of doing dependency parsing, you're using MST algorithms, minimum spanning tree algorithms, and that's actually a very successful way of doing it. Um, you can view it as a kind of a constraint satisfaction problem, um, and people have done that. But the way we're going to look at is this fourth way, which is in these days most commonly called transition-based parsing, though when it was first introduced, um, it was quite often called deterministic dependency parsing. And the idea of this is that we're kind of greedily going to decide which word each word is a, um, dependent of, guided by having a machine learning classifier. And 
um, this is the method you're going to use for assignment two. So one way of thinking about this is so far in this class, you know, we only have two hammers. Um, one hammer we have is word vectors, and you can do a lot of word with word vectors. And the other hammer we have is how to build a classifier as a feed-forward neural network um, with a softmax on top so it classifies between um, two cl various classes, and it turns out that if those are your two hammers, um, you can do dependency parsing this way, and it works really well, and so therefore that's a great approach um, for um, using an assignment too. And it's not just a great ap approach for assignment too. Actually, method four is the, w the dominant way these days of doing dependency parsing, because it has extremely good properties of scalability. That greedy word there is a way of saying um, this is a linear time algorithm, which none of the other methods are. So in the modern world of sort of web scale parsing, it's sort of become most people's um, favorite method. So I'll say more about that very soon. Um, but before we get to that, um, we have AJ doing our research spotlight with one last look back at word vectors. Am I on? Okay, awesome. So let's take a break from dependency parsing and talk about something we should know a lot about, uh, word embeddings. So for today's research highlight, we're going to be talking about a paper titled Improving Distributional Similarity with Lessons Learned from Word Embeddings. And it's authored by Levy et al. So in class, we've learned two major paradigms for generating word vectors. We've learned count-based distributional models which essentially utilize uh, a co-occurrence matrix um, to produce your word vectors. And we've learned SVD, which is singular value decomposition. And we haven't really talked about PPMI, but in effect, it still uses that co-occurrence matrix to produce sparse vector encodings for words. We've also learned neural network-based models, which you all should have lots of experience with now. Um, and specifically, we've talked about skipgram, uh, negative sampling, as well as CBAO methods, and GLOVE is also a neural network-based model. And the conventional wisdom is that neural network-based models are superior to count-based models. However, Levy et al. proposed that hyperparameters and system design choices are more important, not the embedding algorithms themselves. So they're challenging this popular convention. And so, Essentially, what they, what they do in their paper is propose a slew of hyperparameters that when implemented and tuned over, the count-based distributional models um, pretty much approach the performance of neural network-based models to the point where there's no consistent better choice across the different tasks that they tried. And a lot of these hyperparameters were actually inspired by these neural network-based uh, models such as Skipgram. So if you recall, which you all should be very familiar with this, uh, we have two hyperparameters in Skipgram. We have the number of negative samples that we're sampling, as well as the unigram distribution smoothing exponent, which we've fixed at 3 over 4, but it can be thought of as more of a system design choice. Um, and these can also be transferred over to the count-based variants. And I'll go over those very quickly. So the one, uh, the single hyperparameter that uh, Levy et al. proposed that had the biggest impact in performance was uh, context distribution smoothing, which is analogous to the unigram distribution smoothing constant, um, 3 over 4 here. And in effect, they both achieved the same um, goal, which is to sort of uh, smooth out your distribution such that you're penalizing rare words. And using this hyperparameter, uh, which, interestingly enough, the uh, optimal alpha they found was exactly 3 over 4, which is the same as um, the skipgram unigram dis smoothing d uh, exponent. They were able to increase performance by an average of three points across tasks on average, which is pretty interesting. And they also proposed shifted PMI, which I'm not going to get into the details of this, but this is analogous to the negative sampling. Um, uh, choosing the number of negative samples in Skipgram. 
And they've also proposed uh, a total of eight hyperparameters um, in total. And we've described uh, one of them, which is the context distribution smoothing. So here's the results. And this is a lot of data. And if you're confused, that's actually the conclusion uh, that I want you to arrive at, because clearly there's no trend here. Um, so what the authors did was take all four methods, try three different windows, and then test all the models across eight different tasks. And those are split up into word similarity and analogy tasks. And all of these, and all of these methods are tuned um, to find the best hyperparameters to optimize for the performance. And the best models are bolded. And as you can see, there's no consistent best model. So in effect, they're challenging the, um, the popular convention that um, neural network-based models are superior to those, the account-based models. However, there's a few things to note here. Number one, um, adding hyperparameters is never a, a, a great thing because now you have to train those hyperparameters, um, which takes time. Number two, um, we still have the issues with count-based distributional models, um, specifically with respect to the computational issues of storing PPMI counts as well as um, performing SVD. So the key takeaways here is that the paper challenges the conventional wisdom that neural network-based models are in fact superior to count-based models. Number two, while model design is important, hyperparameters are also key for achieving good results. So this applies specifically to you guys, um, especially if you're doing a project instead of assignment four. Like you might implement the model, but that might only take you halfway there. Um, some models to find your optimal hyperparameters might take days or even weeks to find. So don't discount their importance. And finally, uh, my personal interest within ML is in deep representation learning. And this paper specifically um, excites me because I think it sort of displays that there's still lots of work to be done in the field. And so the final takeaway is challenge the status quo. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, AJ. Um, okay, and so now um, we're back to um, learning about how to build a transition-based dependency parser. Um, so um, maybe in 103, a compiler's class, um, formal languages class, there's this notion of shift-reduce parsing. How many of you have seen shift-reduce parsing somewhere? A minority, it turns out. They just don't teach formal languages the way they used to in the 1960s in computer science anymore. Um, um, you'll just have to spend more time with Jeff Ullman. Okay, um, well, I won't assume that you've all seen that before. Um, okay. Um, so what we have, so essentially what we're going to have is, um, I'll just skip these two slides and go straight to the pictures because they'll be much more understandable. Um, but before I go on, I'll just mention um, the picture on this page. Um, that's a picture of Joachim Nivre. So Joachim Nivre um, is a computational linguist in Uppsala, Sweden, um, who pioneered this approach of transition-based dependency parsing. He's one of my favorite computational linguists. I mean, he was also an example, um, going along with what AJ said, of sort of doing something, you know, unpopular and out of the mainstream and proving that you could get it to work well. So in an age when everyone else was trying to build sort of fancy dynamic program parsers, um, Joachim said, no, no, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take each successive word and have a straight classifier that says what to do with it and go on to the next word completely greedy because I 
Maybe that's kind of like what humans do with incremental sentence processing, and I'm going to see how well I can make that work. And it turned out you can make it work really well. Um, so, um, so, and then sort of transition-based parsing has grown to this sort of really widespread dominant way of doing parsing. So um, it's good to find something different to do that other people, if everyone else is doing something, it's good to think of something else that might be promising that you've got an idea from. And I also like Joachim um, because he's actually another person who's really interested in human languages and linguistics, um, which is actually seems to be a minority of the field of natural language processing when it comes down to it. Okay, so here's some more formalism, um, but I'll skip that as well and show it to you afterwards, and I'll give you the idea of what an ARC standard tradition, transition based dependency parser does. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a sentence that we want to parse, I ate fish. Um, and so we've got um, some rules for parsing, which is the transition scheme, which is written so small you can't possibly read it. But this is how we start. So we have two things. We have a stack, and the stack has kind of got the um, gray cartouche around it. And we start off parsing any sentence by putting it on the stack one thing, which is our root symbol. Okay, um, and the stack has its top towards the right. Um, and then we have this other thing which gets referred to as the buffer, and the buffer's in the orange cartouche, and the buffer is the sentence that we've got to deal with. And so the thing that we regard as the top of the buffer is the thing to the left because we're going to be taking off successive words, right? So the top of both of them is sort of at that intersection point um, between them. Okay, and so to do parsing under this transition-based scheme, there are three operations that we can perform. We can perform that they're called shift, left arc, and right arc. Um, so the first one that we're going to do is shift operation. So shift is really easy. All we do when we do a shift is we take the word that's on the top of the buffer and put it on the top of the stack. And then we can shift again and we take the word that's on the top of the buffer and put it on the top of the stack. Remember the stack, the top is to the right, the buffer, the top is to the left. Um, that's pretty easy, right? Okay, so there are two other operations um, left in this um, arc standard transition scheme, which were left arc and right arc. So what left arc and right arc are going to do is we're going to make attachment decisions by adding a word as a dependent either to the left or to the right. Okay, so what we do for left arc is on the stack, we say that the second to the top of the stack is a dependent of the thing that's the top of the stack. So i is a dependent of 8, and we remove that second top thing from the stack. So that's a left arc operation. And so now we've got a stack with just root 8 on it, but we collect up our decisions. So we've made a decision that i is a dependent of 8, and that's that set a that I'm writing in small print off to the right. Okay, so we still had our buffer with fish on it, so the, last, so the next thing we're going to do is shift again and put fish on the stack. And so at that point, our buffer is empty. We've moved every word onto the stack in our sentence, and we have on it root 8 fish. Okay, so then the third operation we have is uh, right arc, and right arc is just the opposite of left arc. So for the right arc operation, we say the thing that's on the top of the stack should be made a dependent of the thing that's second to top on the stack, we remove it from the stack, and we add an arc saying that. Um, so we write arc, um, so we say fish is a dependent of 8, um, and we remove fish from the stack, but we add a new de dependency saying that fish is a dependent of 8, and then we write arc one more time, um, so then we're saying that 8 is a dependent of the root, um, so we pop it off the stack, and we've just left with root on the stack, and we've got one new dependency saying that 8 is a dependent of root. So at this point, um, 
And I'll just mention, right, in reality, there's, I left out writing the, the buffer in a few of those examples there just because it was getting pretty crowded on the slide, but really the buffer is always there, right? It's not that the buffer disappeared and came back again, it's just I didn't always draw it. Um, so, but in our end state, we've got one thing on the, on the stack and we've got nothing in the buffer and that's the good state that we want to be in if we finish parsing our sentence correctly. And so we say, okay, we're in the finished state and we stop. Um, and so that is almost all there is um, to um, arc standard transition based parsing. So if I just sort of go back to these slides that I skipped over, um, right, so we have our stack and our buffer, and then on the side we have a set of dependency arcs A which starts off empty um, and we add things to, and we have this sort of set of actions which are kind of legal moves that we can make for parsing, and so this was this was how things are. So we have a start condition, root on the stack, buffer is the sentence, no arcs. We have these three operations that we can perform. Here I've tried to write them out formally. So the sort of vertical bar is sort of um, appends an element to a list operation. Um, so this is sort of um, having um, wi is the first word on the buffer. Um, it's written the opposite way around for the stack because the head's on the other side. And so we can sort of do this shift operation of moving a word onto the stack. And these two arc operations add a new dependency um, and then removing one word from the stack. And our ending condition is one thing on the stack. Um, which will be the root, um, and an empty buffer. And so that's sort of the formal operations. Um, so the idea of transition-based parsing is that you have this sort of set of legal moves to parse a sentence in a sort of a shift-reduced way. I mean, this one I referred to as arc standard because it turns out there are different ways you can de define your sets of dependencies. But this is the simplest one, the one we'll use for the assignment, and one that works pretty well. Question. I was going to get to that. So I've told you the whole thing except for one thing, um, which is this just gives you a set of possible moves. Um, it doesn't say which move you should do when. Um, and so that's the f remaining thing that's left. And I have a slide on that. Um, okay, so the only thing that's left is to say, gee, um, at any point in time, you know, like we were here, at any point in time, you're in some configuration, right? You've got certain things on the, certain things in the stack, certain things in your buffer, you have some set of arcs that you've already made, um, and which one um, do I, what, which of these operations do I do next? Um, and so that's the final thing. And the way that you do that, that Nivra proposed, um, is, well, what we should do is just build a machine learning classifier. Since we have a tree bank with parses of sentences, we can use those parses of sentences to see which sequence of operations would give the correct parse of a sentence. I'm not actually going to go through that right now, but if you have the structure of a sentence in a tree bank, you can sort of work out deterministically the sequence of shifts and reducers that you need to get that structure. And it's indeed unique, right, that for each tree structure there's a sequence of shifts and left arcs and right arcs that will give you the right structure. So you take the tree, you read off the correct operation sequence, and therefore you've got a supervised classification problem, say, in this scenario, what you should do next is you should shift. And so you're then building a classifier to try to predict that. Um, so in the early work um, that um, started off um, with Neva and others in the mid 2000s, this was being done with conventional um, machine learning classifiers. So maybe an SVM, maybe a Perceptron, um, a kind of Maxent Softmax classifiers, various things, but sort of some um, classifier that you're going to use. Um, so if you're just deciding between 
the operations, shift left arc, right arc, you've got at most three choices. Occasionally you have left less because if there's nothing left on the buffer, you can't shift anymore. So then you'd only have two choices left maybe. Um, but something I didn't mention when I was showing this is when um, I added to the arc set, I didn't only say that fish is an object of eight. I said, oh, the dependency is it's the object of eight. And so if you want to include dependency labels, the standard way of doing that is you just have subtype of left arc and right arc. So rather than having three choices, if you have approximately 40 different dependency labels, as we will in assignment two and in universal dependencies, you actually end up with a space of 81 Clark 81 way classification because you have classes with names like left arc as an object or left arc as an adjectival modifier. Now for the assignment you don't have to do that. So for the assignment we're just doing untyped dependency trees which sort of makes it a bit more scalable and easy for you guys. So it's only a sort of a three way decision is all you're doing. But in most real applications it's really handy to have those dependency labels. Um, Okay, and then what do we use as features? Well, in the traditional model, you sort of looked at all the words around you. You saw what word was on the top of the stack, what was the part of speech of that word, what was the first word in the buffer, what was its parts of speech. Maybe it's good to look at the thing beneath the top of the stack and what word and part of speech it is and um, further ahead in the buffer. So you're looking at a bunch of words, you're looking at some attributes of those words such as their part of speech, and that was giving you a bunch of features which are the same kind of classic um, categorical sparse features that of traditional machine learning and people are building classifiers over that. Yeah, question. Yeah, um, so yeah, the question is are most tree banks annotated with part of speech and the answer is yes. Um, um, yeah, so I mean, we haven't, we've barely talked about part of speech so far, things like giving things nouns and verbs. So the, the simplest way of doing dependency parsing is you're first running a part of speech tagger to assign parts of speech to words, and then you're doing the syntactic structure dependency parsing over a sequence of word part of speech tag pairs. Though there has been other work that's been doing, that's done joint parsing and part of speech tag prediction at the same time, which actually has some advantages advantages because you can kind of explore sort of the, since the two things are associated, you can get some advantages from doing it jointly. Okay, so in the simplest possible model, um, which was what Nivra started to explore, right, there was absolutely no search. You just took the next word, ran your classifier and said, oh, that's the object of the verb, what's the next word? Hmm, okay, that's one's a noun modifier, and you went along and just made these decisions. Now, you could obviously think, gee, maybe if I did some more searching and explore different alternatives, I could do a bit better, and the answer is yes, you can. So there's a lot of work in dependency parsing, which uses various forms of beam search where you explore different alternatives. Um, and if you do that, it gets a ton slower and it gets a teeny bit better in terms of your performance results. Um, okay, but um, especially if you start from the greediest end or if you have a small beam, um, the secret of this type of parsing is it gives you extremely fast linear time parsing because you're just going through your corpus no matter how big and say, what's the next word? Okay, attach it there. What's the next word? Oh, attach it there. And you kind of keep on chugging through. Um, so when you know people like prominent search engines and suburbs south of us um, want to parse the entire content of the web, they use a parser like this because it goes um, super fast. Okay. Um, and so what was shown was these kind of greedy dependency parsers, you know, their accuracy is slightly below the best dependency parsers possible, but their performance is actually kind of close to it. And the fact that they're sort of so fast and scalable more than makes up for their teeny performance decrease. So that's kind of exciting. Um, Okay, so then for the last few minutes, I now want to get back to um, neural nets. Um, okay, so where are we at the moment? So at the moment, we have a configuration where we have a stack and a buffer and parts of speech of words. And as we start to build some structure, the things, the arcs that we've 
taken off the, the things that we've taken off the stack when we build arcs, we can kind of sort of think of them as starting to build up a tree as we go, as I've indicated with that example below. So the classic way of doing that is you could then say, okay, well, we've got all of these features like top of stack is word good, or top of stack is word bad, or top of stack is word easy, top of stack's part of speech is adjectives, top of stack's word is noun. And if you start doing that when you've got a combination of positions and words and parts of speech, um, you very quickly find that the number of features you have in your model is sort of order 10 million. Um, you know, extremely, extremely large. But you know, that's precisely how these kinds of parsers were sort of standardly made in the 2000s. Um, so you're building these huge machine learning classifiers over sparse features. And commonly you even had features that were conjunctions of things because that helped you predict better. So you had features like um, the second word on the stack is has and its tag is um, present tense verb and the top word on the stack is good and things like that would be one feature and that's where you easily get into the 10 million plus features. Um, so even doing this already worked quite well. Um, but the starting point from going on is saying, well, it didn't work completely great. Um, that, that we wanna do better than that and we'll go on and do that in just a minute. Um, but before I do that, I should mention just the evaluation of dependency parsing. Evaluation of dependency parsing is actually very easy because since for each word we're saying what is it a dependent of, that we're sort of making choices of what each word is a dependent of, and then there's a right answer, which we get from our tree bank, which is the gold thing. We're sort of essentially just counting how often we are right, um, and it's, which is an accuracy measure. And so there are two ways that that's commonly done. One way is that we just look at the arrows and ignore the labels and that's often referred to as the UAS measure, unlabeled accuracy. Um, and or we can also pay attention to the labels and say you're only right if you also get the label right. And that's referred to as the LAS, the labeled accuracy score. Yes. You can, you can have, so the question is, don't you have waterfall effects if you get something wrong high up that'll destroy everything else um, further down? You do get some of that because um, that, yeah, one decision will prevent some other decisions. It's typically not so bad because even if you misattach something like a prepositional phrase attachment, you can still get right all of the attachments inside the noun phrase that's inside that prepositional phrase, so it's not so bad. And I mean, actually, dependency parsing evaluation suffers much less badly from waterfall effects than doing CFG parsing, which is worse in that respect. Um, so it's not so bad. Okay, um, I had one slide there which I think I should skip. Um, let me, okay, I'll skip on to um, neural ones. Okay, so, um, so people could build um, quite good machine learning dependency parsers on these kind of categorical features. But you know, nevertheless, there was problems of doing that. Um, so problem number one is you know, the features were just super sparse. Um, that if you typically might have a tree bank that is an order about a million words, um, and if you're then trying to train 15 million features, which are kind of different combinations of configurations, not surprisingly, a lot of those configurations you've seen once or twice. So you just don't have any accurate model of what happens in different configurations, you're just kind of getting these weak, fe weak feature weights and crossing your fingers and hoping them for the best. Now it turns out that modern machine learning, crossing your fingers works pretty well, um, but nevertheless you're suffering a lot from sparsity. Okay, the second problem is you also have an incompleteness problem because lots of configurations you'll see at runtime will be different configurations that you just never happen to see the configuration when exquisite was the second word on the stack and the top word of the 
the stack stack with speech or something, you know, that all any kind of word pair you'll only have seen a small fraction of them. So lots of things you don't have features for. But the third one is a little bit surprising. Um, it turned out that when you looked at these symbolic dependency parsers and you asked what made them slow, what made them slow wasn't running um, your SVM or your dot products in your logistic regression or things like that, all of those things were really fast. That what these parsers were ending up spending 95% of their time doing is just computing these features and looking up their weights because you had to sort of walk around the stack and the buffer and sort of put together a feature name and then you had to look it up in some big hash table to get a feature number and a weight for it and all the time was going on that. Um, so even though they were linear time, that slowed them down a ton. Um, so, um, in a paper in 2014, um, Danchi and I um, developed this alternative where we said, well, let's just replace that all um, with a neural net classifier. So that way we can have a dense compact feature representation and do classification. So rather than having our 10 million categorical features, we'll have a relatively modest number of dense features and we'll use that to decide our next action. And so I want to spend the last few minutes sort of showing you how that works and this is basically um, question two of the assignment. Um, Okay, and basically just to give you the headline, you know, this works really well. So this was sort of Joachim Nivra's parser, Malt parser. So it has pretty good UAS and LAS and it had this advantage um, that it was really fast. When I said that's been the preferred method, I give you some contrasts in gray. So these are two of the graph-based parsers. So the graph-based parsers had been somewhat more accurate, but they were kind of like two orders of magnitude slower. So if you didn't want to parse much stuff and you wanted accuracy, you'd use them. But if you wanted to parse the web, no one used them. Um, and so the cool thing was um, that by doing this as a neural network dependency parser, we were able to get much better accuracy. We were get able to get accuracy that was virtually as good as the best um, graph-based parsers at that time. And we were actually able to build a parser that works significantly faster than Malt parser because of the fact that it wasn't spending all this time doing feature combination. It did have to do more vector matrix multiplies, of course, but th that's a different story. Um, okay, so how did we do it? Well, so our starting point was, you know, the two tools we have, right? Distributed representation. So we're going to use distributed representations of words. Um, so similar words have close by vectors. We've seen all of that. Um, we're also going to use part, in our parser, we use part of speech tags and dependency labels. And we also learn distributed representations for those. That's kind of a cool idea because it's also the case that parts of speech have some are more related than others. So if you have a fine-grained part of speech set where you have plural nouns and proper nouns as different parts of speech from nouns, singular, you would want to say that they're close together. So we also had distributed representations um, for those. Um, so now we have the same kind of configuration. We're going to run exactly the same um, transition-based dependency parser. So the configuration is no different at all. But what we're going to extract from it is, you know, at the starting point we extract certain positions just like Nivra's malt parser. But then what we're going to do is for each of these positions like top of stack, second top of stack, buffer, etc. We're then going to look them up in our embedding matrix and come up with a dense representation. So we might be representing words as sort of a 50 or 100 dimensional word vector representation of the kind that we've talked about. And so we get those representations for the different words as vectors. And then what we're going to do is just concatenate those into one longer vector. So any configuration of the parser is just being represented as a longest vector. Well, where it's not that long, our vectors are sort of more around a thousand, not ten million. Yeah.
Oh, so the, sorry, the, the dependency I'm feed, right, the question is what's this dependency I'm feeding as an input? The dependency I'm feeding here as an input is I've rem when I've previously built some arcs that are in my arc set, I'm thinking, oh, maybe it'll be useful to use those arcs as well to help predict the next decision. So I'm using previous decisions on arcs as well to predict my follow-up decisions. Okay, so how do I do this? And this is essentially um, what you guys are gonna build. Um, so, right, so from my configuration, I take things out of it, I get their embedding representations, and I concatenate them, concatenate them together, and that's my input layer. Um, I then run that through a hidden layer, um, is a neural network, feed forward neural network, I then have, from the hidden layer, I run that through a softmax layer, and I get an output layer, which is a probability distribution over my different actions um, in the standard softmax. And then, of course, I don't know what any of these numbers are gonna be, so what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be using cross-entropy error and then backpropagating down um, to learn things. Um, and this is the whole model, um, and it, learns super well, and it produces a great dependency parser. Um, I'm running a teeny bit short of time, but um, there's, let me just, I think I'll have to rush this, but I'll just say it. Um, yeah, I mean, so on non-linearities, we've mentioned non-linearities a little bit. Um, we haven't said very much about them. Um, and I just want to say a couple more sentences on nonlinearities. I mean, you know, something like a softmax, you can say that using the logistic function gives you a probability distribution. That's kind of what you get in generalized linear models and statistics. Um, in general, though, you want to say that for neural networks, you know, having these nonlinearities sort of lets us do function approximation by putting together these various neurons that have some nonlinearity, we can sort of piece, put together little pieces like little wavelets to do function approximation. And the crucial thing um, to notice is you have to use some nonlinearity, right? Deep networks are useless unless you put something in between the layers, right? If you just have multiple linear layers, um, they could just be collapsed down into one linear layer, that the sort of product of linear transformations, affine transformations, is just an affine transformation. So deep networks without nonlinearities do nothing. Okay, and so we've talked about logistic um, nonlinearities. A second very commonly used nonlinearity is this tan H nonlinearity, um, which is, tan H is normally written a bit differently but if you sort of actually do your little bit of math, um, tan H is really the same as a, a logistic, just sort of stretched and moved a little bit. And so tan H has the advantage um, that it's sort of symmetric around zero. And so that often works a lot better if you're putting it in the middle of a neural net. But in the example I showed you earlier, and for what you guys will be using for the dependency parser. The suggestion to use for the first layer is this linear rectifier layer. And linear rectifier nonlinearities are kind of freaky. Um, they're not some interesting curve at all. Linear rectifiers just map things to zero if they're negative and they're linear if they're positive. And when these were first introduced, I, I thought these were kind of crazy. I couldn't really believe that these were gonna work and do anything useful. Um, but they've turned out to be super successful. So in the middle of neural networks, these days, often the first thing you try and often what works the best is um, what's called ReLU, which is rectified linear unit. Um, and they just sort of effectively have these nice properties where if you're on the positive side, the slope is just one, which means that they transmit error in the back propagation step really well, linearly, back down through the network. And if they go negative, that gives enough of a nonlinearity that they're just sort of being turned off in certain configurations. And so these relu nonlinearities have just been super, super successful. Um, and that's what we suggest um, that you use in the dependency parser. Um, okay, so I should stop now. Um, so. Um, 
But this kind of putting a neural network into a transition-based um, parser is, was just a super successful idea. So if any of you heard about the Google announcements of Parsi McParseface and SyntaxNet for their kind of open source dependency parser, it's essentially exactly the same idea of this, just done with a bigger, scaled up, better optimized neural network. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>